Good morning, thrill seekers. Welcome to my Super Bowl, or should I say Admiral Kimmel's Super Bowl, but I repeat myself. Harvey Siegel, thank you, sir, for that effusive, inflated, hyperbolic introduction that I provided for you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there's a story within the Pearl Harbor story. It's the story of a nation under attack for five years, to be sure. But it's also the story of a man under attack for 64 years. A conscientious man of probity who has been humiliated, disgraced, and scapegoated for 64 years. That man is my grandfather. I'm his eldest grandson. As you will soon hear from the luminaries of the day, it was an unfair, unjust, deceptively dishonest, despicable act 64 years ago, and it remains all the more disgraceful today. I ask you, is it important that a naval officer should live to see his 41 years of unblemished service annihilated in little more than 41 minutes? Well, the Congress of the United States thinks that it is. And that is why the Congress passed a law recommending that this administration posthumously advance Rear Admiral Kimmel and Major General Short to their highest held temporary ranks in World War II of Admiral and Lieutenant General, respectively, in accordance with the Office of Personnel Act of 1947. But this administration refuses to do so and refuses to provide to the American public available and requested information explaining why, and refuses, they tell us, even to bring this important matter of national honor to the attention of the President of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you now, and I will ask you again, to help me help this administration bring this important matter of national honor to the attention of the President of the United States. What is the effect of this administration's refusal to implement the Congress's recommendation? Well, number one, it mocks the Congress. Number two, inexplicably, it continues to tolerate Pearl Harbor perjury. And number three, it perpetuates the myth that Admiral Kimmel and General Short were solely blamable for the success of the Japanese attack, as they are the only two persons otherwise qualified under the Office of Personnel Act of 1947 who have not been so advanced. In other words, the only two persons officially punished for the success of the Japanese attack. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure for me to be with you today. And if you're only able to take one thing away with you from our time together this morning, please hear this. If we continue to ignore the lessons we should have learned from the Pearl Harbor attack, the lessons the Pearl Harbor survivors have been trying to teach us for 64 years, then we are doomed to repeat the errors of the Pearl Harbor attack as we have done and are doing with the 9-11 attack and as I fear we will do with the next attack. So what should we do about it? Well, how's this for a three-step action plan? Number one, let's remember Pearl Harbor and keep America alert the very motto of the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association. <clears throat> Number two, let's officially determine true accountability for the success of the Pearl Harbor attack. And that's what we're going to do today. And number three, 
should you invite me back again, <coughs> let's officially determine true accountability for the success of the 9-11 attack, and that's what we would do if we ever get together again, but I do not have time to do that today. <sighs> okay, it's now time to put some flesh on these bones. Stay with me. With a little bit of effort on your part, I promise you an investigation to determine true accountability for the success of the Japanese attack. Number two, I promise you some facts you've never heard before. Number three, I promise you some free stuff. And hopefully some fun along the way. After all, it is my job this morning to talk. It is your job to listen. Ladies and gentlemen, should you finish before I do, <laughs> then God bless you. I am frequently asked, what's the best book on Pearl Harbor? Yes, I am biased. It's my grandfather's book. Shown right here, it was written in 1954, reprinted in 1955. An excellent copy of this book reposes in marvelous form at this website. If, for some reason, you are unable to obtain a copy at that website, send me an email at that email address and I will get you a copy electronically at that website. Okay? I am frequently asked what's the best current book on Pearl Harbor. Clearly, it is this book pictured over here by University of Florida Professor Emeritus Michael Gannon, Pearl Harbor Betrayed, written in, 19, in 2001, published 2002. He had access to my grandfather's papers, all 30,000 pages of them, which are housed at the University of Wyoming. I know he had access to them because I have microfilm of all 30,000 pages, and I gave the microfilm to Professor Gannon. There's all kinds of brand new information in that book. I highly recommend it to you. I can't send you that book, but I can send you the essence of it. If you send me an email, I will send you an article printed in the Naval Institute of Proceedings, which gives the essence of that book in 1994. I'll send that to you electronically. All this has to be done electronically. Okay. How well have we remembered Pearl Harbor and kept America alert, ladies and gentlemen? How many of you watched the 9-11 Commission hearings? Anybody? How many saw our former National Security Advisor and now Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice testify under oath on national television before the Kane Commission, the 9-11 Commission, in which she said, under oath, the problem was that for a country that had not been attacked on its territory in a major way in almost 200 years, there were a lot of structural impediments to those kinds of attacks. Ladies and gentlemen, need I remind you that 64 years ago, Hawaii was a territory of the United States, and it was indeed attacked in a major way. There's a story within the Pearl Harbor story. This is part of the story. That's my dad at age five. This is my grandfather, Naval Academy graduate 04. My dad was a Craddock Academy graduate of 36. His older brother was a Naval Academy graduate in 1935. And as you can see, was killed in the war, killed in action as commanding officer of a submarine Robolo in the Balabac Straits in 1944 or 45. We're not exactly sure because nothing was ever recovered. My great grandfather, Admiral Kimmel's father, pictured here, Graduated from West Point in the class of 1857. As I'm sure you've already figured out, perilously close to the Civil War. And indeed, my grandfather fought the first battle of Bull Run or Manassas for the North. He was from Missouri. <clears throat> After the battle, he went back to Missouri, considered his options, resigned his commission, and fought the best rest of the war for the Confederate States Army. And fight he did. He fought at Vicksburg, Holly Springs, Corinth, Pea Ridge. He fought with Magruder's Raiders, a host of lesser engagements, and miraculously survived the war, or we would not be having this conversation this morning. This graphic is notable for a couple of other reasons. Number one, after the, uh, after the war, my grandfather, my great-grandfather again considered his options, went back to Missouri. <clears throat> now all of his options were bad. So he and several other Confederate officers got on horseback and hightailed it to Mexico and laid low until things cooled off before they returned to Kentucky. 
This irony is not lost for a moment on this FBI agent who spent a great deal of his 25 years in the FBI looking for federal fugitives, of which my great-grandfather would have qualified handsomely. <coughs> this also is the first year, 1857, that West Point took photographs of their graduating class. There were 38 members of the class. This photograph comes from the Time Life series uh, on the Civil War. The particular volume is called Brother vs. Brother. On page 38, you'll find this uh, photograph. There were three members of the 38-member class who fought for both the North and the South during the Civil War, and the other two did not survive. The last thing i like to mention about this graphic is, ladies and gentlemen, if you detect a tendency for me during the remainder of my remarks to speak out of both sides of my mouth, you'll know that I come by it honestly. <laughs> These are the submarines that my dad was on during the war. He was in uh, Manila Bay on this floating coffin, S-40. He was actually in the bachelor officer's quarters. He was not aboard the ship because the habitability on these old S-boats, these old submarines, was so bad that when you were in port, you didn't even consider trying to stay on the boat. So he was uh, in the bachelor officer's quarters. It was 2 a.m. in the morning, Manila time, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, 7.30 a.m. Hawaii time. <coughs> My, grand, my dad was given no special instructions, no special precautions. None of the 26 submarines that were in Manila Bay were given any special instructions or any special precautions. My dad woke normally four hours after the attack, walked down to the lobby of the bachelor <coughs> officer's quarters, and was notified that Pearl Harbor was under attack. He should conduct himself accordingly. So he walked to his submarine, got on the submarine, and left Manila Bay along with the other 26 submarines that were alongside the pier, alongside the tender, or anchored in Manila Bay. Ladies and gentlemen, if the Japanese had attacked those 26 submarines in Manila Bay on December 7, 1941, instead of the eight battleships at Pearl Harbor, they would have advanced their war effort by an order of magnitude. These are the submarines that my uncle, my dad's older brother, <coughs> were on, was on during the war. He was on drum at the Battle of Midway. He was on Rattan. As you can see, they sank everything in sight. He was commanding officer of Robolo when it was lost with all hands. <coughs> Admiral Kimmel had three sons. His older son that was killed in the war, my dad, who deceased in 1997, and a much younger son, my uncle Ned, who is the patriarch of the Kimmel family today. He's 83 years old. He lives in Wilmington, Delaware. He also fought in World War II on Navy ships, the Vixen and the Ranger but he strayed badly and went to the Ivy League. <laughs> Graduated from Princeton and Harvard Law School, and he is largely responsible for the legislation that I alluded to earlier. This photograph, ladies and gentlemen, is perhaps my favorite photograph of all time. And the reason for it is simple, because I know exactly how difficult it was for the Time Life photographers that took this photograph in 1991 to get both my dad and my uncle smiling at the same time like they are here. This is my uncle after he graduated from Princeton in 1945. He's at the Joint Congressional Committee hearing alongside his dad, Admiral Kimmel. My name is Thomas Kincaid Kimmel. <clears throat> As if Admiral Kimmel didn't have enough problems, he had a brother-in-law Admiral Kincaid, who was perhaps the fifth or sixth most famous admiral in the history of the United States Navy. <coughs> admiral Kincaid was the commander in chief of the Seventh Fleet during the Battle of Leyte Gulf. To further refresh your recollection, the Battle of Leyte Gulf was the biggest naval battle in the history of the world. This is what Admiral Kimmel's brother-in-law had to say about Admiral Kimmel in 1961 in an oral history project at Columbia University. I always thought Admiral Kimmel was very unjustly treated. The proceedings of the Roberts Commission that went into the matters out there were entirely illegal. Kimmel was made a scapegoat. That's what it was undoubtedly, nothing else. This is my first ship out of the Naval Academy. I graduated in 1966. This is my second ship out of the Naval Academy. This is my third ship. <clears throat> and this represents my 25 years in the FBI and then another year and a half on contract with the FBI. And now I digress. I promised you an investigation to determine true responsibility for the success of the Japanese attack. The term responsibility is very loosely used in the United States government, so I thought it would be <coughs> helpful to have this little exercise 
and compare the responsibility of Harvey Siegel in having me here today with the responsibility of visited upon the heads of my grandfather and General Short after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Stay with me if you will. Consider this please. Harvey is clearly responsible for having me here today in the sense that he had to properly respond to information that he had. That doesn't tell us very much. Harvey clearly is also accountable for having me here today in the sense that he had to properly account for everything he did and did not do in getting me here today. Just like Admiral Kimmel and General Short had to account for everything they did and did not do. But we haven't learned much yet. What we really want to know is, is Harvey blamable for having me here today? <laughs> and of course, ultimately for you to decide, ladies and gentlemen, should Harvey be punished for having me here today? I show you this graphic for one reason, and one reason only. I want you to remember this word, blamable. Would you do that for me, please? Is it possible to have a responsible military commander, and yet one who is not blamable? Well, apparently, it is, as recent history dictates. General Sanchez was found responsible for Abu Ghraib, but he was not found culpable. What's another word for culpable? Anybody? Blamable, absolutely, thank you. Admiral King, there were five five-star admirals in the history of the United States Navy. One of them was Admiral King. Admiral King was the chief of naval operations throughout the entire, almost the entire World War II. <coughs> Admiral King said this about punishment for Admiral Kimmel. The evidence adduced against Admiral Kimmel warrants neither trial by general court-martial nor punishment in any form. Ladies and gentlemen, the Kimmel family posits that by singling Admiral Kimmel out as the only flag officer not to receive the benefits of the Officer Personnel Act of 1947 to an honorable man is a form of punishment. And the only redress we seek is the elimination of that blot on the family name. There's no money involved. The only person that can do it is the President of the